Chapter 17 The Call of Elisha God had bidden Elijah anoint another to be prophet in his stead. Elisha the son of Shaphat, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room, he had said. And in obedience to the command, Elijah went to find Elisha. As he journeyed northward, how changed was the scene from what it had been only a short while before. Then the ground was parched, the farming districts unworked, for neither dew nor rain had fallen for three and a half years. Now on every hand vegetation was springing up as if to redeem the time of drought and famine. Elisha's father was a wealthy farmer, a man whose household were among the number that, in a time of almost universal apostasy, had not bowed the knee to Baal. Theirs was a home where God was honored and where allegiance to the faith of ancient Israel was the rule of daily life. In such surroundings, the early years of Elisha were passed. In the quietude of country life, under the teaching of God and nature and the discipline of useful work, he received the training in habits of simplicity and of obedience to his parents and to God that helped to fit him for the high position he was afterward to occupy. The prophetic call came to Elisha while, with his father's servants, he was plowing in the field. He had taken up the work that lay nearest. He possessed both the capabilities of a leader among men and the meekness of one who is ready to serve. Of a quiet and gentle spirit, he was nevertheless energetic and steadfast. Integrity, fidelity, and the love and fear of God were his, and in the humble round of daily toil he gained strength of purpose and nobleness of character, constantly increasing in grace and knowledge. While cooperating with his father in the home life duties, he was learning to cooperate with God. By faithfulness in little things, Elisha was preparing for weightier trusts. Day by day, through practical experience, he gained a fitness for a broader, higher work. He learned to serve, and in learning this, he learned also how to instruct and lead. The lesson is for all. None can know what may be God's purpose in His discipline, but all may be certain that faithfulness in little things is the evidence of fitness for greater responsibilities. Every act of life is a revelation of character, and he only who in small duties proves himself a workman that needeth not to be ashamed can be honored by God with higher service. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. He who feels that it is of no consequence how he performs the smaller tasks proves himself unfit for a more honored position. He may think himself fully competent to take up the larger duties, but God looks deeper than the surface. After test and trial, there is written against him the sentence, Thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. His unfaithfulness reacts upon himself. He fails of gaining the grace, the power, the force of character which is received through unreserved surrender. Because they are not connected with some directly religious work, many feel that their lives are useless, that they are doing nothing for the advancement of God's kingdom. If they could do some great thing, how gladly they would undertake it. But because they can serve only in little things, they think themselves justified in doing nothing. In this they err. A man may be in the active service of God while engaged in the ordinary everyday duties, while felling trees, clearing the ground, or following the plow. The mother, who trains her children for Christ, is as truly working for God as is the minister in the pulpit. Many long for special talent with which to do a wonderful work, while the duties lying close at hand, the performance of which 
would make the life fragrant, are lost sight of. Let such ones take up the duties lying directly in their pathway. Success depends not so much on talent as on energy and willingness. It is not the possession of splendid talents that enables us to render acceptable service, but the conscientious performance of daily duties, the contented spirit, the unaffected, sincere interest in the welfare of others. In the humblest lot, true excellence may be found. The commonest tasks, wrought with loving faithfulness, are beautiful in God's sight. As Elijah, divinely directed in seeking a successor, passed the field in which Elisha was plowing, he cast upon the young man's shoulders the mantle of consecration. During the famine, the family of Shaphat had become familiar with the work and mission of Elijah, and now the Spirit of God impressed Elisha's heart as to the meaning of the prophet's act. To him it was the signal that God had called him to be the successor of Elijah. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow thee. Go back again, was Elijah's answer, for what have I done to thee? This was not a repulse, but a test of faith. Elisha must count the cost, decide for himself to accept or reject the call. If his desires clung to his home and its advantages, he was at liberty to remain there. But Elisha understood the meaning of the call. He knew it was from God, and he did not hesitate to obey. Not for any worldly advantage would he forego the opportunity of becoming God's messenger or sacrifice the privilege of association with his servant. He took a yoke of oxen and slew them and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen and gave unto the people, and they did eat. Then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him. 1 Kings 19, verses 20 and 21. Without hesitation, he left a home where he was beloved to attend the prophet in his uncertain life. Had Elisha asked Elijah what was expected of him, what would be his work, he would have been answered, God knows. He will make it known to you. If you wait upon the Lord, he will answer your every question. You may come with me if you have evidence that God has called you. Know for yourself that God stands back of me and that it is his voice you hear. If you can count everything but dross that you may win the favor of God, come. Similar to the call that came to Elisha was the answer given by Christ to the young ruler who asked him the question, What good thing shall I do, that I may inherit eternal life? If thou wilt be perfect, Christ replied, Go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. Matthew 19, verses 16 and 21. Elisha accepted the call to service, casting no backward glance at the pleasures and comforts he was leaving. The young ruler, when he heard the Savior's words, went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Verse 22. He was not willing to make the sacrifice. His love for his possessions was greater than his love for God. By his refusal to renounce all for Christ, he proved himself unworthy of a place in the Master's service. The call to place all on the altar of service comes to each one. We are not all asked to serve as Elisha served, nor are we all bidden to sell everything we have. But God asks us to give his service the first place in our lives, 
to allow no day to pass without doing something to advance his work in the earth. He does not expect from all the same kind of service. One may be called to ministry in a foreign land. Another may be asked to give of his means for the support of gospel work. God accepts the offering of each. It is the consecration of the life and all its interests that is necessary. Those who make this consecration will hear and obey the call of heaven. To everyone who becomes a partaker of his grace, the Lord appoints a work for others. Individually we are to stand in our lot, saying, Here am I, send me. Whether a man be a minister of the word or a physician, whether he be merchant or farmer, professional man or mechanic, the responsibility rests upon him. It is his work to reveal to others the gospel of their salvation. Every enterprise in which he engages should be a means to this end. It was no great work that was at first required of Elisha. Commonplace duties still constituted his discipline. He is spoken of as pouring water on the hands of Elijah, his master. He was willing to do anything that the Lord directed, and at every step he learned lessons of humility and service. As the prophet's personal attendant, he continued to prove faithful in little things, while with daily strengthening purpose, he devoted himself to the mission appointed him by God. Elisha's life after uniting with Elijah was not without temptations. Trials he had in abundance, but in every emergency he relied on God. He was tempted to think of the home that he had left, but to this temptation he gave no heed. Having put his hand to the plow, he was resolved not to turn back, and through test and trial he proved true to his trust. Ministry comprehends far more than preaching the word. It means training young men as Elijah trained Elisha, taking them from their ordinary duties and giving them responsibilities to bear in God's work, small responsibilities at first and larger ones as they gain strength and experience. There are in the ministry men of faith and prayer, men who can say, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life, that which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you. 1 John 1, verses 1 to 3. Young, inexperienced workers should be trained by actual labor in connection with these experienced servants of God. Thus, they will learn how to bear burdens. Those who undertake this training of young workers are doing noble service. The Lord Himself cooperates with their efforts. And the young men to whom the word of consecration has been spoken, whose privilege it is to be brought into close association with earnest godly workers, should make the most of their opportunity. God has honored them by choosing them for His service and by placing them where they can gain greater fitness for it. And they should be humble, faithful, obedient, and willing to sacrifice. If they submit to God's discipline, carrying out His directions, and choosing His servants as their counselors, they will develop into righteous, high-principled, steadfast men, whom God can entrust with responsibilities. As the gospel is proclaimed in its purity, men will be called from the plow and from the common commercial business vocations that largely occupy the mind and will be educated in connection with men of experience. As they learn to labor effectively, they will proclaim the truth with power. Through most wonderful workings of divine providence, mountains of difficulty will be removed and cast into the sea. The message that means so much to the dwellers upon the earth will be heard and understood. Men will know 
what is truth. Onward and still onward the work will advance until the whole earth shall have been warned, and then shall the end come. For several years after the call of Elisha, Elijah and Elisha labored together, the younger man daily gaining greater preparedness for his work. Elijah had been God's instrument for the overthrow of gigantic evils. The idolatry which, supported by Ahab and the heathen Jezebel, had seduced the nation, had been given a decided check. Baal's prophets had been slain. The whole people of Israel had been deeply stirred, and many were returning to the worship of God. As Elijah's successor, Elisha, by careful, patient instruction, must endeavor to guide Israel in safe paths. His association with Elijah, the greatest prophet since the days of Moses, prepared him for the work that he was soon to take up alone. During these years of united ministry, Elijah from time to time was called upon to meet flagrant evils with stern rebuke. When wicked Ahab seized Naboth's vineyard, it was the voice of Elijah that prophesied his doom and the doom of all his house. And when Ahaziah, after the death of his father Ahab, turned from the living God to Baalzebub, the god of Ekron, it was Elijah's voice that was heard once more in earnest protest. The schools of the prophets established by Samuel had fallen into decay during the years of Israel's apostasy. Elijah re-established these schools, making provision for young men to gain an education that would lead them to magnify the law and make it honorable. Three of these schools, one at Gilgal, one at Bethel, and one at Jericho, are mentioned in the record. Just before Elijah was taken to heaven, he and Elisha visited these centers of training. The lessons that the prophet of God had given them on former visits, he now repeated. Especially did he instruct them concerning their high privilege of loyally maintaining their allegiance to the God of heaven. He also impressed upon their minds the importance of letting simplicity mark every feature of their education. Only in this way could they receive the mold of heaven and go forth to work in the ways of the Lord. The heart of Elijah was cheered as he saw what was being accomplished by means of these schools. The work of reformation was not complete, but he could see throughout the kingdom a verification of the word of the Lord. Yet I have left me seven thousand in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal. 1 Kings 19, verse 18. As Elisha accompanied the prophet on his round of service from school to school, his faith and resolution were once more tested. At Gilgal, and again at Bethel and Jericho, he was invited by the prophet to turn back. Tarry here, I pray thee, Elijah said, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. But in his early labor of guiding the plow, Elisha had learned not to fail or to become discouraged, and now that he had set his hand to the plow in another line of duty, he would not be diverted from his purpose. He would not be parted from his master so long as opportunity remained for gaining a further fitting up for service. Unknown to Elijah, the revelation that he was to be translated had been made known to his disciples in the schools of the prophets, and in particular to Elisha. And now the tried servant of the man of God kept close beside him. As often as the invitation to turn back was given, his answer was, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they too went on, and they too stood by Jordan. 
And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters, and they were divided hither and thither, so that they too went over on dry ground. And it came to pass, when they were gone over, that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. Elisha asked not for worldly honor, or for a high place among the great men of earth. That which he craved was a large measure of the Spirit that God had bestowed so freely upon the one about to be honored with translation. He knew that nothing but the Spirit which had rested upon Elijah could fit him to fill the place in Israel to which God had called him. And so he asked, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy Spirit be upon me. In response to this request, Elijah said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. See Second Kings 2, verses 1 to 11. Elijah was a type of the saints who will be living on the earth at the time of the second advent of Christ, and who will be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, without tasting of death. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 and 52. It was as a representative of those who shall be thus translated that Elijah, near the close of Christ's earthly ministry, was permitted to stand with Moses by the side of the Savior on the Mount of Transfiguration. In these glorified ones, the disciples saw in miniature a representation of the kingdom of the redeemed. They beheld Jesus clothed with the light of heaven, they heard the voice out of the cloud, acknowledging him as the Son of God. They saw Moses, representing those who will be raised from the dead at the time of the second advent. And there also stood Elijah, representing those who at the close of earth's history will be changed from mortal to immortal and be translated to heaven without seeing death. In the desert... In loneliness and discouragement, Elijah had said that he had had enough of life and had prayed that he might die. But the Lord in his mercy had not taken him at his word. There was yet a great work for Elijah to do, and when his work was done, he was not to perish in discouragement and solitude. Not for him the descent into the tomb, but the ascent with God's angels, to the presence of his glory. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel, and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more, and he took hold of his own clothes, and rent them in two pieces. He took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him, and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan, and he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him, and smote the waters, and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elisha went over. And when the sons of the prophets which were to view at Jericho saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him, and bowed themselves to the ground before him. Second Kings 2, verses 12 to 15 When the Lord in his providence sees fit to remove from his work those to whom he has given wisdom, he helps and strengthens their successors, if they will look to him for aid and will walk in his ways. 
they may be even wiser than their predecessors, for they may profit by their experience and learn wisdom from their mistakes. Henceforth Elisha stood in Elijah's place. He who had been faithful in that which was least was to prove himself faithful also in much.